you say in the face of God. You saw this the evidence given the court and jury in the case now in the for the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yes. Hey, Mr. Jackson, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, doctor, could you state your full name and spell your last name for us, please? Daniel Michael Wolf, last name spelled W O L F E. Dr. Wolf, um, what do you do for a living? I am the director of accident reconstruction at a company known as ARCA, A R C C A. And what is ARCA exactly? So ARCA is a forensic engineering consulting firm. We have a variety of disciplines that include human factors, biomechanics, crashworthiness, accident reconstruction, uh, just to name a few. What as the, based on your title, it sounds like you're the director of the entire accident reconstruction format for ARCA, correct? That is correct. What sort of contracts does ARCA routinely engage in? So we do a lot of work in civil litigation, so we work with insurance carriers, law firms, but we also consult with uh, and do projects with the federal government as well as uh, the National Hockey League on player safety. So we're involved uh, in a number of research projects as well. Is there other clientele that seeks out ARCA for accident reconstruction or biomechanics or human factors issues? Uh, in terms of beyond the parties that I just listed? You mentioned the U.S. Department of uh, Defense? Yes, the, the military, yes, the Army. Tell me a little bit about the, the work that you've done for the Department of Defense. Well, that was before my time, but I'm aware of projects that dealt with working on uh, vehicles that were uh, over in uh, the Middle East, uh, where they basically designed energy-absorbing seats uh, because there was injuries when the vehicles were going over IEDs. Is ARCA known both nationally and internationally? Or is it recognized as a, as a leader in accident reconstruction issues? Yes. As the director of accident reconstruction at ARCA, do you specialize in both accident reconstruction and the human factors that are associated with such reconstruction where necessary? Yes. Can you give me a synopsis of the professional discipline of what is accident reconstruction? I think a simple definition in my mind would be the application of physics, engineering science, and, and mathematics to collision events. I always like to think of it as if you, you open up a puzzle box and you dump the pieces out and you've got a bunch of pieces and you're trying to piece to get together the evidence to see how everything fits to get a clear picture. And what is the application of human factors to that process? So to give you an example of, of human factors in the field of accident reconstruction, um, so I do a lot of nighttime visibility and conspicuity work. So to give you an example of that, let's say a driver's driving down the road at night, there's a pedestrian that's crossing the road. So we want to have an understanding based upon that pedestrian's clothing, the headlights of the vehicle, any potential artificial lighting in the area. When does a driver recognize that individual on the roadway? And then we can also look at literature to have an understanding of how do drivers respond based upon the hazard they're presented with. So there's different response times depending on the hazard. So it's going to be different for a pedestrian crossing the roadway or a driver responding to a, a, a vehicle suddenly stopping in front of them. Dr. Wolf, as an accident reconstructionist, do you investigate and reconstruct both um, passenger vehicle issues, commercial vehicle issues, uh, motor vehicle, pedestrian issues, all of the above? Yes, I see all types of accidents. And how long have you been doing this work with ARCA? A little over seven years now. What education, training, and background qualifies you to perform the duties that you've just described for the jury? Back in 2012, I received a Bachelor of Science in Engineering from James Madison University, along with a minor in Mathematics. Some of my courses while at JMU included courses in Physics, Statics, Dynamics, Kinematics, Material Science, along with your other Engineering Sciences. Uh, subsequent to my, my undergraduate degree, I then went on to the University of Delaware to pursue my PhD in Electrical and Computer Engineering with a concentration in Electromagnetics and Photonics. What additional training or experience do you have as it relates to accident reconstruction in addition to the, the formal education and the PhD? Certainly. So in addition to, to my, my undergraduate degree and my PhD, I, I've continued to take courses through Northwestern University in crash reconstruction. Um, some of those courses have included human factors, lighting. I've taken courses on uh, electronic vehicle data, photogrammetry, uh, three-dimensional laser scanning, so I've continued to take courses subsequent to, to graduating. Do you also hold any accreditations in terms of accident reconstruction? 
Yes, I'm accredited by an organization known as ACTAR, which is the Accreditation Commission for Traffic Accident Reconstruction. Are you trained in photogrammetry? Yes, sir. Is that uh, to determine vehicle crash incidents or uh, the, the circumstances surround them, surrounding them based on map scenes, evidence from photographs, things of that nature? Absolutely. So photogrammetry is, is the science of extracting information, if you will, out of photographs. So things dimensionally about an object, spatially, without ever actually physically seeing the object or inspecting it. So you don't have to be at the scene to effectively and scientifically reconstruct it to your, to your satisfaction? No, not at all. And, and quite frankly, uh, to be honest with you, in my world in, in civil litigation, Oftentimes, by the time a case comes across my desk, it's, you know, the accident happened five years ago. Some I've even had 10 or 15 years ago. So getting access to the vehicle at that point, uh, it's going to be a long shot. Doctor, are you a member of any uh, professional societies? Yes. Describe those, please. So I'm a member of the Society of Automotive Engineers, SAE. I'm also a member of the National Association for Professional Accident Reconstructionists, uh, the Optical Society of America, and also the Illuminating Engineering Society. How many cases uh, would you say in your experience in your career have you reconstructed or attempted to reconstruct, you, know, you or your team members? Ooh, um, I don't actively track that. Uh, if I had to estimate at this point in my career, uh, I would probably be well over 1,000. And how many of those 1,000, I know you'd have a number specific, but how many of those 1,000 would you say involved pedestrians as well? But several hundred. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, a great, <clears throat> excuse me, a great deal of my work is, is in the field of lighting and visibility. So there's a direct correlation between time of day and pedestrian incidents. We see a, a rise uh, in the evening and night hours just due to drivers having difficult, uh, a difficult ability to try to perceive and recognize individuals. So I, I certainly see a lot of pedestrian collisions in my casework. <clears throat> done testing or research as it relates to the kinematics and the interaction between pedestrians and vehicles. Absolutely. So we do a number of tests at ARCA to look at the interaction between pedestrians and vehicles. One of the ones I know I did most recently where we were evaluating a vehicle essentially rolling over a pedestrian. So we wanted to understand the vehicle dynamics as well as the interaction between the pedestrian and the road surface. So we conducted testing at ARCA to evaluate that. Does ARCA have any other disciplines other than just accident reconstruction? Absolutely. So as I mentioned earlier, we have crash worthiness. So again, that's where you're going to be looking at the safety of a vehicle. How does it perform in a crash? Uh, we have human factors, failure analysis, premise liability, and, and biomechanics. As an accident reconstructionist, doctor, do you or have you studied uh, or tested the forces that are at play between objects, objects interacting, a human being interacting with a vehicle, for instance? Yeah, absolutely. That's part of what you do. Yes, sir. Describe that. So we use hybrid instrumented dummies at ARCA for our testing. So if that's, if we want to have an understanding that an occupant in a vehicle, the forces that they might experience, or for, for any matter, for, uh, again, if it's an instance where you have something that ends up falling on, on someone's head and you want to have an understanding of the forces involved in that, we perform testing with, with hybrid dummies. Have you ever authored any peer-reviewed uh, papers in the field of physics? Yes, sir. Describe those for me. So I have a number of, of papers uh, in the field of, of lighting and optics. Uh, I have a, a recent publication that deals with Toyota and Lexus vehicle control history records as well. Is that called Toyota vehicle control history, seven breaking history recording characteristics? Yes, sir. All right. Was that specific to dealing with vehicles and their interaction with other vehicles and or pedestrians? Uh, it involved looking at the the various triggers that that system is capable of recording. And specifically, it was looking at what triggers a sudden braking event. So we were able to determine that those triggers, the sudden braking event, is triggered when a driver, or I should say the vehicle, Jackson, reaches. May we approach? Sure. <laughs> May I, Your Honor? Yes, you Thank can you. move on. Um, you've been qualified in other courts to testify as an expert in the area of accident reconstruction. Is that right? Yes, sir. Um, you were not hired by the defense in this case, correct? That is correct. At the time you did your expert review, Dr. Wolf, uh, and your consultation, uh, you and I had never met. That's correct. You did, not who I, no, you did not know who I was? I did not. You had never met Ms. Little? No. Mr. Unetti? No. Matter of fact, you'd never heard of this case? That's correct. Um, you were hired by another agency not connected in any way to the defense, is that right? Correct. And not connected in any way to the Commonwealth, is that right? 
Correct. So your analysis and your conclusions and your opinions are completely independent of the defense and the Commonwealth in this case. Is that right? Jackson. Sustained. Mr. Jackson, you can ask it differently. When you did your analysis and conclusions, well, let me ask it this way. You finalized your report, you and your team, correct? Correct. That report is contained, oops, that report is contained <clears throat> in a multi-page document uh, that was submitted following your analysis and your opinions and conclusions, right? Correct. Uh, we didn't, the, the defense didn't have anything to do with that, correct? Correct. You had never met us, didn't know who we were when you did this. Correct. You'd never met Mr. Lally, didn't know who he was when you did this. Correct. So your analysis, opinions, testing, and conclusions were at, were requested by a completely separate agency. That is correct. All right. Um, goes to, without saying, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask it anyway. You haven't been paid by the defense? You have not paid us anything, no. Um, and you don't work for us? That's correct. As a matter of fact, I've never asked you specific questions about your testing before today. That is correct. Your work product, the report that you provided, was provided both to, to the defense as well as the Commonwealth. Is that right? That's my understanding, yes. And you were equally available to both sides? In terms of them reaching out? Correct. Uh, yes. And I called you ultimately after receiving your report, asked if you'd join us and testify, correct? That is correct. All right. Were you and your team asked to undertake a review for purposes of accident reconstruction of the case that's now pending before the court? Yes, sir. Was your team asked to do this by the agency that ultimately retained you, not us? That's correct. Um, who at ARCA was assigned to the team who would ultimately undertake this job of accident reconstruction? It was myself, Dr. Andrew Rentschler, and Scott Klein. What was Dr. Rentschler's role in this case as it's distinguished from your role in the case? Certainly. So Dr. Rentschler is a biomechanical engineer, uh, and ultimately he assessed whether or not there was a mechanism for the injuries of Mr. John O'Keefe. And what was your focus? If he's talking about the injuries to Mr. O'Keefe, what was your focus in your reconstruction and your analysis? Uh, I, I would simply say it was looking more at the damage to the vehicle. Okay. So in terms of your team and the, the responsibilities of each of the team members, you were more focused on the damage to the SUV. Dr. Richler was more focused on the injuries suffered by Mr. O'Keefe, correct? Uh, I think that's, that's a fair character, characterization, although uh, with the caveat that we worked together as a team, so we weren't isolated kind of in those areas, you know, not speaking to each other. We certainly worked together on the analysis. Understood. Were you provided or did you review certain materials uh, in furtherance of your consultation in this matter? Yes. What were you provided? Uh, we were provided photographs of the incident location. We were provided photographs of the Lexus. Uh, there were a couple of incident reports that we received. Um, I could look at my report for the full list, but those so were the ones. You can go ahead and do that, Doctor. Do you have the report with you? Yes, sir. Uh, I have a copy of it. Is this faster? Sure. If you... May I? Sure. <laughs> How many categories of materials were you provided? Provided, it would be approximately 10. Uh, could you list those off for the jurors, please? It would be the Norfolk SPDU Homicide Death Report, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Department of State Police Crime Scene Report, <coughs> OCME Dispatch Removal Report, photographs of the incident location, videos of the incident location, Photographs of the 2021 Lexus LX570, photographs of recovered evidence, crash data retrieval report from the 2021 Lexus 570, report of autopsy and autopsy photographs. Based on these data that you were provided, were you able to satisfactorily, to your mind, satisfactorily engage in the consultation that you were hired to do? Yes. And come up with some opinions and conclusions based on scientific certainty. Yes. Did you review scene photographs of the alleged incident? Yes, sir. What information were you able to glean or gather from your review of the, the photographs from the scene? 
specifically. Mm -hmm. So from those photographs, I was able to identify there was fragments of transparent, uh, red, clear plastic. There also appeared to be pieces of chrome and black plastic. I also observed what appeared to be glass fragments along with a black drinking straw. Did you also review some videos? Yes. Uh, that was out at scene, maybe a leaf blower? Correct. It appeared to be daytime, yes. Okay. Uh, what did you note about the photography at the scene of the items that were being photographed? Well, I think one thing that comes to mind is it, it was a little bit difficult to follow the evidence, so to speak. So typically, when I go out and do an inspection, especially of a, of a fresh incident, let's say I've got a debris field or I've got tire marks, um, what I like to do is, is kind of step into the scene, if you will, where you take uh, global perspective shots and then you step into a specific piece of evidence so that you can, at a later point in time, identify where that evidence is. I, I noted that in a lot of these photographs, I didn't see a whole lot of that stepping in. It was essentially just zoomed right into where that evidence is, but not really having a great understanding of where was it relative to all of the other evidence. Or when it got there. Correct. Um, based on your review of all the materials that you described for the court, uh, did you get an understanding of what the Commonwealth's theory of the case is, specifically that Mr. O'Keefe was struck by the Lexus SUV? Objection. Sustained. Did you come to understand that uh, the allegations before the court were that Mr. O'Keefe was struck by the vehicle? Objection. Sustained. Ask it differently, Mr. Jackson. Did you perform an accident reconstruction specifically focused on determining whether or not damage to the Lexus was consistent with hitting Mr. O'Keefe? Yes, I think that's a fair characterization. And reversing that, was your accident reconstruction also focused on whether or not the injuries to Mr. O'Keefe were the result of being hit by a vehicle? Yes. Okay. Um, during your analysis, did you note the damage to the vehicle? Yes, sir. Describe that, please. Uh, so the primary damage was to the right taillight. Uh, it appeared to be uh, fractured with the majority of the lens cover, so that, that clear and red plastic covering missing from it. Uh, in addition to that, uh, to the if you're looking at the back of the vehicle, to the left of that, um, in the area above the, uh, there's also another tail lamp assembly on the lift gate. Uh, so above that assembly, there was a small dent along with some paint chips on the bumper, uh, more so on the wraparound section as it kind of curves around to the right side of the vehicle. There appeared to be some superficial scratches as well in that area. Was there any other damage or deformation that you were able to glean uh, from your review, uh, the photogrammetry, damage to the Lexus, the bumpers, the panels, the quarter panel, the, the sheet metal, anything like that? No, the rest was remarkably intact. Is it common in vehicle pedestrian collisions that there is some sort of bumper displacement and or sheet metal deformation that's concomitant to that? Absolutely. Assuming a pedestrian is positioned in a normal upright position, you certainly would expect to see uh, damage to the bumper. In a lot of cases, what happens is, you know, the, the bumper is just clipped on. So, again, the force of that impact will oftentimes cause the bumper to kind of become um, unmounted or unclipped. Uh, you certainly could see deformation to body paneling, such as the lift gate or the quarter panel as well. Is that especially true at higher speeds, meaning above 15 miles per hour or so? Oh, absolutely, yes. Was there any apparent damage to the Lexus that appeared consistent with any kind of pedestrian interaction that you saw? No, it was, again, it was really confined to just the taillight, a very isolated portion of the vehicle. During your, your review and your investigation, did you note uh, information concerning items that were supposedly found on the bumper? Yes. What was that? Uh, I believe it was noted there was two apparent glass fragments located on the top bumper cover. What's the significance of the presence of those items or the lack of materiality of those items in your view? Well, I, again, I think it's going back to the, the scene evidence. Uh, again, we knew that there was glass fragments, what appeared to be from a drinking glass um, at the scene of the alleged incident. 
is there any glass consistent with the glass that was supposedly found on the bumper in the taillight housing, the taillight mechanism, anything from the car, from the Lexus, that would account for that glass? Okay, I think I understand. So the, the taillight itself does, is not comprised of any glass. It is all plastic. So it, it, that damage, or I should say that glass on the top bumper cover could not have come from the right taillight. Now, based on your review of the information that, that was provided to you, did you undertake any testing of that vehicle? I'm sorry, any testing concerning uh, the damage to the vehicle? Yes, sir. All right, can you describe what that testing was? So we performed, uh, again, this is with Dr. Rentschler and I working together on this again. Uh, we performed uh, projectile testing to the tail lamp uh, with a drinking glass as well as a hybrid head form. What was, let's take those one at a time. The, how would you describe the, the drinking glass test? Certainly. So, uh, again, from our review of the evidence, we knew that we had an isolated portion of damage to Lexus confined to the, the taillight. So we know that we're dealing with potentially a small object that could have created that. Looking at, again, the evidence in terms of the scene photographs, we know that we have a damaged drinking glass at the scene in the vicinity of the fragments of the taillight. So the theory that Dr. Rentschler and I put forward is potentially an individual through this drinking glass at the back of the Lexus causing the taillight to fracture. I'm so, going to interrupt you right, right, right there. You and Dr. Rentschler formed that theory and wanted to test that theory, correct? Yes. You were not told that theory by the defense because you've never met us? Correct. You were not told that theory by the Commonwealth. You met, never met them, correct? Correct. Your theory was the product of simply having some facts extant in the data. You had a broken drinking glass, a broken taillight. Let's put them together and figure out if the drinking glass could be responsible for the taillight and vice versa. Absolutely, yes. And that was your determination of, well, we, we were given instructions to reconstruct this. Let's look at every single angle, correct? Absolutely. And, and, and I will note, as, as part of the engagement with the entity that retained us, we were asked not to do any outside research or investigation of the case. It was to be based solely on the evidence that we were provided. Okay. As a matter of fact, and importantly, while you were doing your testing, had you ever even heard of the Karen Reed case? No. So getting back to that testing, and I interrupted your flow, uh, you were looking at whether or not the glass could have produced the damage to the rear taillight that you saw, correct? Correct. And what did you do in furtherance of, of making a determination about whether or not that was possible? Certainly. So myself and one of our, our lab technicians at ARCA, we designed and developed a pressurized air cannon. So it was capable of firing a projectile such as a drinking glass at the taillight. Um, so it essentially sent it, it's, you can think of it kind of as a giant cannon, but it had a, a barrel, um, and then there was a valve that would open rapidly, and directly behind that was a pressurized vessel. Uh, and depending on the pressure, the PSI of that vessel uh, would determine essentially the speed at which that, that glass would be projected into the taillight. So you literally built a cannon? Yeah, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> pretty cool job. Uh, Tell me what the results of your testing was with this pneumatic cannon that would fire the, the drinking glass. Certainly. So we performed uh, two different tests in terms of speeds. The, the target speeds were uh, 30 and 40 miles per hour. Why was that? Well, so with consultation with Dr. Rentschler, he indicated that that is a, a reasonable speed at which an adult male or an individual, for that matter, could throw a drinking glass at the taillight. Had anybody up to that point... Anybody told you specific, any specific, in, um, let me see if I can rephrase that. Had anybody indicated that there was any evidence whatsoever that John O'Keefe had thrown a tail of uh, uh, drinking glass at the taillight? No. Was this another example of you and Dr. Richler and your team just uh, exploring sort of every possibility and working a little bit in the blind? Objection. Sustained. What was the reason that you decided, or you and your team decided, that you wanted to approximate how a grown man could throw a, tail, a, a glass at a taillight? Well, I think we, we wanted to have an understanding is when a projectile, such as a drinking glass, interacted with the taillight, would we get damage on the test taillight that was consistent with that of the subject taillight? Understood. 
So based on your, your, your theory, were you able to approximate the damage on the taillight? Yes. Describe that for us. So as I mentioned, we, we ran two tests. The, the target speeds were at, at 30 and, and 40 miles per hour. And there was a little bit of variability in terms of what our target was and, and what we actually achieved. So the achieved speeds were at 31 miles per hour and 37 miles per hour. So there's just depending on how the glass leaves the, the barrel and some of the rotation can affect some of the speed uh, or ultimately the, the end result speed to that. So um, what I will say, though, is that with the 37 mile per hour uh, projectile into the taillight, we noted and observed that there was damage that was consistent with that of the, the subject tail lamp and that the test tail lamp had the majority of the uh, outer lens uh, fractured and, and missing, broken into pieces, as well as some, some underlying damage to some of the internal components as well. Are you saying, well, let me ask you a different question. You were able to replicate the damage to the taillight using a pneumatic cannon firing a glass at 37 miles an hour directly at the taillight, correct? Correct. All right. Uh, and that would also shatter the, the glass too, correct? Correct. Did you do any testing about whether or not that damage to the taillight could be produced by a person simply holding a glass and being hit by the car driving in reverse? We didn't do any testing of that, and, and primarily because, again, if, if we're looking at the, the arm and its total length, right, we, again, we only have a, a narrow damage pattern, which on the taillight, if you, if you think about where um, the kind of where it meets the, the lift gate into where it starts to wrap around to the side of the vehicle. That's only about six and a half inches in width. All right. When you fired the, get, the, the glass into the taillight, the taillight was static. In other words, it was not going to move. It was immovable at that point, correct? Correct. All right. So the glass is hurling through the air at 37 miles an hour and hits the static object that's resisting. <clears throat> and that smash is what produced ultimately the taillight damage that you were able to replicate. Is that right? Yes. If a person were holding in his hand the glass and the taillight were to hit that hand, the hand would not remain static, correct? Jackson. Sustained. Ask it differently, Mr. Jackson. If, if the taillight were to, to... The taillight would make contact with a person holding a glass. Would that replicate what you did in terms of your firing a glass into the taillight? In other words, are they, are they apples and apples? I, I, no, I don't think it would be the same. Okay. Why is that? Well, as I mentioned earlier, um, again, the, the damage to the, the back of the Lexus, again, is confined to just that roughly, again, when we're talking about the taillight itself, that six and a half inch section in width. Right. So it's inconsistent with the total length of the arm and certainly from discussion with Dr. Rentschler, inconsistent with the injuries to the arm. So given everything in your investigate, that your investigation was revealed concerning the, this testing, uh, are you saying that the taillight was damaged by John O'Keefe holding a drinking glass that was hit by an SUV? Objection. Sustained. You, in all the, uh, the information that you provided, you have, you would not provided anything that suggested that John O'Keefe threw a glass at the taillight. Right? Objection. Sustained. Yes, yeah, just yes. What information, if any, were you provided that suggested that John O'Keefe threw a glass at the taillight? No information. What information, if any, were you provided that suggested that John O'Keefe may have had a pneumatic cannon with him that night? Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any information regarding that. All right. Uh, you also did some testing concerning a, a drop test. Is that right? Correct. Tell us about that drop test testing. 
Certainly. So, uh, again, through discussion with Dr. Rentschler, it was my understanding that Mr. O'Keefe had a skull fracture on the back of his head. So we wanted to do an evaluation of the interaction between the back of a, a head. In this case, we used the, again, talking about that instrumented dummy again, we used the instrumented hybrid head form uh, to perform a drop test to evaluate the forces of an interaction between a tail light from the Lexus and uh, the human head. What height did you choose to, do, to perform this drop test? Seven and a half feet. Why did you choose that height? Well, if you, if you calculate it through physics uh, and the acceleration due to gravity, that would equate to an impact speed of 15 miles per hour at that height. And what was the significance of 15 miles per hour? Well, that, that was essentially kind of a starting point for us, if you will. So I will tell you that in reverse, 15 miles an hour is, is fast. Um, I don't know if you've ever looked at your speedometer when you're pulling into your driveway or reversing into it into a parking stall. Uh, most people probably don't go more than, than five miles an hour or so. So 15 miles an hour in reverse is fast, especially when we're talking about, uh, it's my understanding it was nighttime. Uh, there was winter conditions, potentially wet or icy roads. So Again, that speed is going to be what I would say on the high end for going in reverse. So also in addition uh, to, to with respect to kind of just the, the nature of that speed, um, it's my understanding through discussion with Dr. Rentschler that at 15 miles an hour, you start to see significant injuries uh, to the human body when it makes contact with, with a vehicle. Um, and I think one last point is that we needed to pick a speed where, again, this is kind of just us brainstorming where we would have damage to the taillight, right? It would fracture it, but it wouldn't completely obliterate it. So we knew if we choose, chose a speed, for instance, of, of 40 miles an hour, we're no, we know we're going to completely essentially explode the taillight. But if we do, you know, one mile an hour, we may not do anything to it, right? So we kind of had to pick a middle ground to, to, again, cause damage to the taillight. What was your conclusion with following that testing? What was your conclusion with regard to uh, whether or not it was consistent or inconsistent with the damage to the truck and the taillight was consistent or inconsistent with making contact with John O'Keefe's head at or above 15 miles an hour? So strictly speaking to a damage perspective, the 15 mile an hour interaction between the hybrid head form and the, the test tail lamp produced significantly more damage than that of the subject vehicle. So that indicates that, again, the damage on the, the subject tail, uh, subject tail light was less than that of the test tail light. So if we were to, if I were to ask you whether or not there would be more or less damage to the tail light if you increase the speed to 24 miles an hour, what is your conclusion? Well, you're talking about significantly more kinetic energy. So if you just think about it from, uh, again, a kinetic energy standpoint, you know, kinetic energy is equal to one half times the mass and the velocity squared. So if you're squaring that velocity and you're going from 15 up to 24 miles per hour, you're gonna get a significant amount of, of more energy associated with that. Probably, I could pull up my calculator, but you're probably looking at two and a half more times energy than, than the 15 mile an hour test. Which means two and a half more times the damage to the taillight? Certainly. Which you did not see in your review of the materials, correct? Correct. So what is your opinion or conclusion as to whether or not the damage to the tail light was caused by striking uh, John O'Keefe's head? From a damage standpoint, uh, it was inconsistent. I want to shift gears back to the injuries that you saw concerning Mr. O'Keefe's arm, his right arm. Uh, during the course of your investigation, did you look at photographs and investigate uh, the injuries to his right arm? Yes, sir. What's the width of the of the taillight, uh, specifically from where it meets the lift gate on the, to, the, to the left side, I'm sorry, to the side of the vehicle, the right side of the vehicle. To the right. So, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, that is about six and a half inches. It, again, it starts to wrap around to the right side, so really it, it's, even though the taillight continues, it's not projecting out on the back end where it's, again, wrapping around. So in terms of the, the width that is facing the rear, if you will, it's about six and a half inches. And you noted that there was a dent in some paint chips that you identified above the lift gate, correct? Correct. How far away from the right side of the vehicle were those scratches in that dent? Approximately 20 inches. What was the significance of that, that distance? 
Well, again, if it, to, to go back to your, your question about, I think, if somebody was holding a drinking glass, right, uh, and their arm was extended to cause that damage, or if it's, it's theorized that those dents and chips were from that, again, the, the thing that sticks out to me is that you have essentially the Lexus taillight. So ask another question. What is the, what's the significance of whether or not there was damage between the dent and the taillight? In other words, that 20-inch area. Was it dented? Was it formed in any way? So in terms of, again, if we're talking about, again, looking at the back of the vehicle and we go to kind of where that right tail lamp just meets the lift gate, as I mentioned, there's another lamp assembly on the lift gate itself. There's also a, a chrome a uh, trim piece above that, and then certainly the body paneling to the lift gate itself. And, and I think what, what stood out to me is that between that dent and the, the fracture taillight, there was no observable damage to that area, which I would have expected had an arm been positioned there. Can you calculate or could you calculate or did you calculate the amount of force that would be required to strike a person just only on the outstretched portion of his arm uh, in order to project him a number of feet, for instance, 30 feet in one direction or another. Okay, I just want to make sure I reject. Take a distance out of it. Break it down. I'll ask you the same question, but without the 30 feet. Okay. Was there... Were you able to calculate, or could you calculate, um, the force that would be required to strike a person on his outstretched arm hard enough to spin him around and project him a number of feet? If you're talking about only an interaction between the arm and, and the back of the vehicle, no, there wouldn't be any projection. Again, if you think about this, the arm weighs about, again, with Mr. O'Keefe would be about 11 pounds. So you still have, you know, another 200 plus pounds being held down by gravity. And the force is only acting on the arm. So essentially the arm would be accelerated, but the whole body, because the center of mass is not being struck, would not be projected. Is the absence of the damage that you described, the absence of damage that you described between the dent and the, the rest of the vehicle, with the exception of the taillight, is that consistent or inconsistent with striking an arm, an outstretched arm of, of a human being? Jackson. I'll allow that. That would be inconsistent, in my opinion. They have just a moment, Your Honor? Yes. And what is your opinion, doctor, as to the amount of damage that you would expect to see at, a, at 15 miles per hour or above on the taillight if, in fact, that vehicle were moving, it, were moving in reverse and were to strike something on a human body, for instance, an elbow or an arm? Or an arm? Objection. I don't know that. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I'm trying. Physics, that's why. Um, from your testing, what would you expect to do? What would you expect to see in terms of the damage to the right rear taillight? If, in fact, that taillight were to make contact with a part of a human body, for instance, an elbow or an arm, elbow or an arm, at 15 miles an hour or above, what would the level of damage be as compared to the damage that you actually saw? Well, if, if we compare it to, uh, again, looking at the, the drop test that we did with the hybrid head, which weighs about 10 pounds. So again, if we're talking about now a human arm that's comparable in that same weight, uh, we certainly would expect to see a comparable level of force and damage. So as I mentioned, uh, if the arm is outstretched um, across the, the right tail lamp and into the lift gate section, I would certainly expect to see deformation to that body paneling, even potentially the tail light. Um, on the lift gate itself and that chrome piece as well. Based on the entirety of your investigation, uh, your entire team's investigation, all the testing that you did, all the biomechanical testing and the engineering and the physics testing that you did, uh, in your expert opinion, 
Was that taillight damaged by striking John O'Keefe from the head? Objection. Sustained. In your opinion, was the taillight damaged by either striking Mr. O'Keefe from the head or the arm? Objection. Sustained. May we approach? Yes. You May I, Your Honor? Yes. Um, last question, Doctor. Uh, in your expert opinion, based on all your testing, is the damage to the taillight that you saw consistent with striking a human head? No. In your expert opinion, is the damage to the taillight consistent with striking a human arm? No. Thank you. That's all I have. All right. Jurors, we will take our morning recess. All right. Report, please. Ms. Tulelli, whenever you're ready. Mm -hmm. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Now, you know, in conjunction with, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Wenschler, is that correct? Dr. Wrenchler, yes. Uh, so you, in conjunction uh, with Dr. Keep your voice up, Mr. Lally. Yes. You, in conjunction with Dr. Wrenchler and uh, Dr. Klein, mm -hmm. uh, wrote a report in regard to your analysis, correct? Correct. And, Doctor, that report was uh, issued on February 12, 2024. Is that correct? Correct. And in the first paragraph of that report, the last two sentences, uh, you or whoever the author of that particular portion indicates, this analysis is based on information currently available to ARCA and is only to be issued in its entirety. However, ARCA reserves the right to supplement or revise this report if additional information becomes available. Is that correct? Correct. And that's pretty standard as far as your industry is concerned. You can only work with the information that you're provided. Is that correct? Certainly. Now, in this instance, you were provided uh, 10 uh, things, and then there were four additional things that uh, either you or the other doctors had uh, reviewed as far as literature or things of that nature. Is that fair to say? Correct. And the 10 things that you uh, were talking about were uh, reports, um, an initial crime scene report, uh, medical examiner dispatch removal report, is that correct? Correct. Uh, photographs of the incident location, is that correct? Correct. And how many sets of photographs of the incident location were you provided with? In terms of the, the number of photographs? Of the number of photographs, sir. Were there different sets of photographs? Yes. And how many sets? I don't recall off the top of my head. I know that there was a series that were taken during the daytime as well as ones taken what appeared to be in the early morning hours. And you were also provided uh, video from, uh, from the early morning hours, is that correct? Uh, I, from what I recall, I think it was daytime, but yes. Photographs of the vehicle, photographs of recovered evidence, is that correct? Correct. Uh, CDR report from the 2021 Lexus uh, LX570, correct? Correct. Um, autopsy report, autopsy photographs, is that correct? Correct. And then some other things uh, that those would be the 10 things that you were provided with. And then there were four other things uh, that, that you reviewed or, or part of your team reviewed. Is that correct? Correct. Now, in regard to uh, the section in your report called review of materials, and it talks about uh, photographs and glass fragments and plastic fragments and things of that nature, correct? Correct. Um, you also talk about a black uh, drinking straw that was recovered on scene. Is that correct? Correct. However, there's no mention in the report about uh, Mr. O'Keefe's shoe or Mr. O'Keefe's hat. Are you aware of those items as well? Yes. And are you aware that Mr. O'Keefe's shoe was actually found dug out from the snow, uh, sort of flushed with the curbing uh, in front of the area where his body was found? Yes. Now, over the course of your work as a crash reconstructionist, um, and again, I don't mean this in any way, shape, or form, but I'm just curious. Um, Typically, you're reconstructing or you're looking at uh, someone else's reconstruction uh, in relation to something that occurred in the past, correct? Uh, not always, no. Well, my question is, sir, how many times have you actually been on like a live scene where the vehicles are still in place at final rest, uh, whether a body is in place at final rest? Have you ever been to a scene uh, where those sort of conditions existed? 
Certainly. We have a rapid response uh, team that essentially we've been on site on the day of or the week of the incident. Yes. Now, how often is that? Uh, not nearly as often as, uh, like I said earlier, we, we primarily do litigation work. So, again, by the time we're retained, the, obviously the scene has been uh, is no longer present. Right. Scene's been cleared. Items have been removed as far as evidence or other things. That's mostly what you deal with, correct? Sure. And as far as the hat that we were talking about before, is um, are you aware that that was recovered as well? Same day as the drinking straw on February 3rd in the area where the body of Mr. O'Keefe was uh, discovered? In the area of the front yard, yes. Now, you have some uh, familiarity uh, through working as a crash reconstructionist with pedestrian collisions, correct? Correct. Is it uh, common or uncommon for a, uh, in the course of a pedestrian uh, collision, for a shoe or glasses or a hat or something to uh, fall off of that pedestrian uh, in the collision sequence near where the area of impact occurs? Well, I think that depends on on the interaction between the two. If we're talking, if it's more of a, a side swipe type interaction, if we're just talking about an arm, for instance, contact the vehicle, no, I would not expect the shoe to come off. If it's something where the entire body is interacting with the vehicle, then yes, there's a greater likelihood that something like a shoe will come off, yes. So that is consistent in general terms with the pedestrian collision of a shoe coming off, correct? Again, based on the, the interaction between the two. I wouldn't say it's a blanket statement that, again, in all pedestrian interactions, you will have a shoe come off. And that's not the question I was asking. So what I'm asking, is it generally consistent with pedestrian collisions that a shoe uh, may come off during the collision sequence near the area of impact? Shoes can't come off in a pedestrian impact, yes. Okay. <clears throat> now, again, you were testifying earlier about the uh, damage to the Lexus being isolated in the area of the tail, correct? Correct. And that was based on the information that you were provided, correct? Correct. Now, with respect um, to any of the materials that you were provided, uh, was there anything in the materials that you were provided that indicated that just the arm or an outstretched arm of Mr. O'Keefe uh, interacted with the vehicle? No. And based on your review of any of the materials that you provided, was there any uh, information uh, stating that Mr. O'Keefe had been struck in the back of the head uh, by the taillight assembly of, of the Lexus? No. And based on any of the uh, materials Let me ask you, based on any materials that you've provided, um, were you aware uh, that Mr. O'Keefe is on video uh, exiting from a bar minutes before a uh, crash occurs at approximately 12, 11 a.m. holding a cocktail glass in his right hand? I'm not aware of that video. Now, other than the materials that we just went over, as far as the 10 things that you were provided, you weren't provided anything else. Is that correct? That would be correct. And so sort of the questions that you endeavored to answer, those were questions uh, that you didn't know from any of the materials that you were provided. Is that correct? Well, if I understand your question correctly, th there was nothing in the material that indicated the questions we were to answer, if that's, if that's what your question was. That is my question. So there was nothing in there, is that correct? Correct. Okay. If I may have a moment, John. Yes. Uh, you talked a bit about, um, you have some extensive background in, in human factors, correct? Correct. And uh, as far as visibility, and in particular, have you ever conducted a visibility analysis? Absolutely, hundreds of times. And you talked a little bit about uh, conspicuity, is that correct? Yes. Um, and part of conspicuity, at least one of the factors, would uh, be a reasonable expectation of, in particular when you're talking about a pedestrian collision, part of the conspicuity factors would include sort of a reasonable expectation that a pedestrian would be in the path of the vehicle. Is that fair to say? I don't understand your question. When you're talking about conspicuity or visibility analysis, in particular, you're talking about 
uh, something called PRT or perception reaction time, correct? Well, that occurs after recognition. So first, a driver has to recognize that there's a pedestrian there before they can actually respond to it. So once they've recognized the pedestrian, then you start the perception response time where, again, the driver has identified what the hazard is. They're making a decision about what to do. They might be moving their foot from the accelerator pedal to the brake pedal. So again, kind of that's the action uh, or the time frame in which the driver is, is undergoing action to potentially mitigate the, the collision. And perception reaction time, that's a pretty commonly used uh, industry sort of standard as, as far as crash reconstruction goes, correct? Well, I, I would say that it's used in the field of accident reconstruction, but as I mentioned earlier in my testimony, there isn't a blanket number in terms of perception response time. As I mentioned, it, it's based upon the hazard that the driver is presented with. Again, if you've got a pedestrian crossing the roadway, that's going to be one particular uh, <clears throat> perception response time based upon studies and naturalistic data versus a driver suddenly stopping in front of you, right? There, there, it's, not, it's not the same perception response time in every scenario. No, understood. And there's different variables that may affect that as far as someone's age, as far as the, the lighting that's available, other things. Is that correct? Sure. And one of those things might be the reasonable expectation of a pedestrian being present in the roadway as you're driving along, correct? Expectancy can play a role, yes. Expectancy, what we're talking about is sort of the disparity or the difference between driving along a country road uh, where there's no houses for miles and miles versus an urban area where there's crosswalks every 15 feet, correct? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> now, in that expectation of privacy, how high would that be if, if we're talking about a pedestrian that actually exited from the vehicle that then strikes? I don't understand your question. Let me ask you this. If the operator of the vehicle has a passenger who then exits the vehicle and goes towards the back, would there be a high reasonable expectation that the pedestrian would be located in that area? I don't know if I would classify it as high. What would you classify it as? I honestly don't know that I have a classification to it. Now, you never looked at uh, the defendant's vehicle in this case, correct? Correct. Uh, are you aware that the defendant's vehicle is still in police custody and available for inspection? I'm not aware of that. Did you ever ask to look at the defendant's vehicle? No. Now, a typical pedestrian strike, uh, for the most part, involves a pedestrian in front of a vehicle as it's coming down a street. Is that fair to say? That can be one type of interaction, yes. Is that more prominently seen as far as your field than, than a rear collision? I would say that's fair. And there are various types of sort of interactions uh, that the pedestrian can have with the vehicle uh, in order to uh, cause and sort of sustain injuries. Is that fair to say? What I would say is that there's certainly, in terms of how the pedestrian interacts with the vehicle, in terms of whether they're being um, wrapped onto the vehicle or projected forward, certainly there's different types of interactions, yes. So there's like a wrap and forward projection type of collision sequence, is that correct? Those are two common, yes. There's also something called a fender vault, is that correct? Correct. Um, and sort of how or where that pedestrian is positioned with relation to the vehicle is somehow or somewhat determinative of the injury sustained. Is that correct? It can be, yes. Uh, obviously, you're going to see different injuries if someone fender vaults and goes over the top of the vehicle versus someone who is projected forward uh, from the collision sequence with the front of the vehicle. Just to clarify, again, in this matter, I, I was not assessing injuries. That was Dr. Rentschler. I don't have an opinion. What, I, what I'm saying is based on your experience, though, that you, you, you understand that there's a difference in the injuries that you might expect based on the type of interaction that, that a pedestrian has with a vehicle. Yes. And then if someone is uh, wrapping forward, projected, and then the vehicle overruns that person, there'd be a whole other host of injuries that you'd expect to see based on being overrun by the vehicle, correct? There could be, Yes. Now, the testing that you did uh, with respect, uh, you, these are essentially experiments that you're doing, correct? That's fair, yes. And am I correct in uh, saying that in scientific experiments or in the world of scientific experiments, there are certain things called variables that you're trying to account for? Is that correct? I would say that's fair, yes. 
And essentially what you're trying to do is control as many of those variables as you can in order to best replicate uh, whatever the conditions were at the time that, uh, that what you're testing to see actually occurred. Is that correct? Correct. Now, what, if anything, did you do to control variables uh, in relation to temperature? Uh, so one of the things we did with all of the tail amp assemblies that we tested is that we preconditioned them to approximately 28 degrees that they had reached a, a steady state temperature before we subjected them to the impact testing. And where in your report does it say that? Uh, I don't believe that's explicitly stated. Is it implicitly stated anywhere in your report? <coughs> Again, it's, it's, I'm telling you that's part of what we did for the testing. I understand that's what your testimony is, but you wrote a report, correct? Right, and I don't know that I detailed every single part of the test. Again, we summarized it. Understood. Um, so what did you do to control any variable as far as wind? Well, when you're talking about a projectile such as a glass, again, that's being projected at 37 miles per hour, uh, again, there would be probably minimal effects in terms of the wind even if there was a blizzard going on? Again, what, what we're going after here is uh, ultimately conducting a test such that the uh, drinking glass arrived at the location of the taillight. So if you're trying to say that, okay, he threw it this way and the wind blew it uh, towards the taillight, sure, that could be a possibility. And, and sir, I'm not trying to say anything. I'm just asking, are you aware that there was a blizzard and that there were wind gusts up to 37 miles per hour during the time that this collision occurred, and that's not accounted for in your test. Okay. Were you aware of that, sir? Uh, I'm aware that there was inclement weather at the time, yes. <clears throat> now, with respect um, to what type of glass did you use? Uh, so we used a, a rocks drinking glass, so that's a glass that has a, a thicker base and a shallower sidewall. And so what I'm asking, sir, was it a cocktail glass, was it a pint glass? What kind of drinking glass are we talking about? A rocks drinking glass. And how tall is that rock drinking glass that you use? Uh, if I had to estimate, I think it was about three or four inches tall, probably. And the thickness, did you measure that as far as the thickness of the bottom of the glass? No. Uh, was the thickness of the bottom of the glass thicker or more thick or less thick than the top of the glass? Are you talking about this in comparison to the sidewall of the glass? Talking about in comparison to itself. So you have a glass, this rock uh, glass. Was the bottom thicker or the top thicker? The, the sidewall would be taller, if you will, than the base. And so when you're projecting this thing out of the, the device that you created, uh, the, the whatever it was, um, are you facing sort of the top of the glass where you would be sipping of, out of, or the bottom of the glass at the tail? So in the testing, the, the interaction between the tail light and the glasses was primarily between the base and the tail light. Now, with reference to, um, <clears throat> I asked you a little bit about uh, the video, and you weren't aware of Mr. O'Keefe exiting from the waterfall bar at 12, 11 in the morning, uh, about 15, 20 minutes before he struck by a vehicle. You're, you're not aware of that? I'm not aware of that. Now, <clears throat> with reference to that particular establishment, was there anything stopping you or uh, the other doctors that you were working with from going to that establishment, finding out what kind of glasses they had, getting an actual cocktail glass? from that establishment? I had no idea that video existed. Did you even know that Mr. O'Keefe was at a bar before he uh, was struck by the vehicle? Uh, I believe that in one of the incident reports we reviewed that uh, there was, I think, a narrative about that they had been at a bar drinking, yes. Now, how is it that you determined where on the taillight assembly to aim? So we looked at the fracture pattern and, and what it appeared to be that it was emanating from uh, basically where the clear portion meets the, the red cover. We kind of saw that the fracture pattern emanated from that. So that's where we targeted it. Now, when you did this testing as far as the, uh, the sort of breakage or the pieces that came off the taillight, is it fair to say that they were of sort of different shapes and sizes, uh, the broken pieces? Sure. Uh, consistent with the broken pieces that were found uh, on the scene near Mr. O'Keefe's body? Yes, I would say that's fair. Now, I know you may not be the, the person for this, but just as far as your review, some of the autopsy report, medical findings in regard to Mr. O'Keefe, correct? Correct. 
and the injuries to Mr. O'Keefe were primarily on the right side of his body, correct? Correct. So there were injuries to his right arm and forearm, elbow area, correct? Correct. There was bruising to his right hand. Do you recall that? Yes. There was an abrasion to the outside or the posterior of his right leg near his knee. Do you recall that? I don't know that I recall that off the top of my head. And do you recall sort of the skull fracture or the laceration uh, that immediately outside of the skull fracture was on sort of the right back of his head? Yes. Now, from the reports <clears throat> that you reviewed, uh, were you aware that when Mr. O'Keefe's body was discovered by the defendant and two of Mr. O'Keefe's friends, that the defendant was the only one who could see him in the conditions? Objection. Sustained. As far as the lighting was concerned in that area where Mr. O'Keefe's body was found, uh, are you aware there was no overhead street ambient lighting or anything like that? Objection. I'll allow that. Uh, I'm not aware of that. And you didn't do any visibility analysis or anything in relation to, to this case, correct? That wasn't a part of my scope in this case. Well, as far as part of your scope, did you define that you indicated earlier that there were questions that you didn't find in the materials that you have to conduct experiments to prove or disprove, correct? Well, again, the, the entity that retained us in this asked us to evaluate whether or not the damage to the vehicle and the injuries to Mr. O'Keefe were consistent with the interaction or in interaction between the two. So you were at least somewhat restricted in the scope of what you could do based on uh, the parameters given to you by the agency that hired you. Is that fair to say? Sure. Now, as far as any statements by the defendant uh, to uh, investigating troopers either that afternoon or that morning when Mr. O'Keefe's body was discovered, were you familiar with any of those? Objection. I'll allow that. I am not familiar with Sure. So, Doctor, with regard to the defendant's statements at any point, were you, uh, did you review, review materials or were you made aware uh, that the defendant said to multiple people on scene, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him? I'm not aware of that. May I have a moment, John? Yes. Now, within the report um, that you and the other doctors uh, submitted, um, there's an indication uh, that if either Mr. O'Keefe's arm or head had interacted with the taillight, there'd be uh, some expectation uh, that either blood or DNA would be uh, contained on that taillight. Is that correct? I believe, yes, that was stated in the report. And at any point were you made aware that Mr. O'Keefe's DNA actually was recovered from that taillight assembly uh, from, from the defendant's vehicle? No, I was not. As far as <clears throat> forensic reports, what, if anything, were you provided in reference to that, other than the initial crime scene report? Are you talking about specific to the scene or forensic reports to the body? Forensic reports specific to the evidence that was recovered from the scene and from the defendant's vehicle. Uh, only what would be listed in the report. Now, you indicated it's one of the materials that you uh, were provided and you reviewed uh, was the EDR event data, recorded data? The crash data retrieval report, yes. Okay. Now, <clears throat> were you shown anything as far as a crash reconstruction report from a trooper from the state police? No. And the EDR data that you observed, did that contain any sort of usable data? There was no events recovered on the black box. And with respect to there being no events recovered on the EDR or the black box, in a pedestrian collision, is that unusual? It is not. And why not? Well, because you're talking about 
<clears throat> excuse me, a very large weight difference between the vehicle and the pedestrian. So ultimately, what the vehicle is, is constantly monitoring is acceleration, um, which uh, gets back to a, a term called delta V. So when the vehicle doesn't experience a, a big delta V, typically the, the threshold for a non-deployment event where you're not firing airbags or any safety mechanisms, but the vehicle wakes up and says, hey, there was, there was something that I potentially hit, and it's usually at a threshold of about five miles per hour. So again, given the weight difference, we usually don't see delta Vs that high with pedestrians. And is that in some respects because what the, what the EDR and what the safety restraint systems are designed to protect is the occupants of the vehicle, correct? That's fair, yes. I mean, there are more innovations as far as vehicles that are more uh, modern or released earlier that have certain pedestrian or, or protections for other vehicles, but primarily what they're focused on is the occupants of the vehicle, correct? Correct. <clears throat> now, at any point in time, were you shown any... Uh, Tech stream data, uh, Toyota tech stream data from the defendant's vehicle. No. Uh, so you weren't shown any data indicating that the defendant's vehicle was uh, off being operated in reverse. The objection sustained. Next question. <coughs> so with regard to the defendant's statements, were you also not told uh, that the defendant told uh, several people that she had just gotten into a fight with Mr. O'Keefe right before? Uh, she dropped them off at 34 Fairview Road. So that's sustained. Now, with regard to pedestrian collisions, um, you're familiar with sort of the, the physics term, I'm presuming, doctor, as far as like center of mass? Yes. And what kind of role does the center of mass uh, for a pedestrian play in relation to uh, the center of mass of a vehicle as far as how the two interact? Well, it depends, again, on the, the vehicle structure. Uh, and, and, again, when you're talking about where's the hood height, the bumper height, uh, and the CG or the center of gravity of the pedestrian, that, again, will kind of dictate how they interact with the, uh, between the vehicle and the pedestrian. Now, typically, a typical pedestrian collision, uh, again, that we were speaking about before, is, is in relation to a, a pedestrian struck by the front of a vehicle, correct? Correct. And so in a typical pedestrian collision, that involves more of an assumption of the velocity of the striking vehicle than you would see occur in sort of a side swipe. Is that correct? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. In a typical pedestrian collision, that would involve more of an assumption of the velocity of the striking vehicle by the pedestrian than you would see in a typical side swipe collision. Is that correct? If I understand your question correctly, yes. If, if the vehicle is, is striking the center of gravity of a pedestrian as opposed to just, for instance, the limb, yes, you're, the, the center of gravity or the body will be accelerated up to that speed. Now, with respect to the defendant's vehicle, again, you never actually looked at the defendant's vehicle. Is that correct? It wasn't necessary. And did you look at the actual taillight housing from the defendant's vehicle? I had sufficient photographs of the taillight. Did you ever look at the actual physical broken pieces of the taillight uh, from the defendant's vehicle? Uh, again, I had sufficient photographs that documented the fragments and pieced them together. And you're aware, at least, that uh, the fragments uh, that were recovered on scene were then uh, sort of put back together and put overlaid over the, uh, the taillight housing that was taken from the defendant's vehicle? Yes. And through any of the pictures or the, fo uh, the photos that you uh, observed, did you ever see a piece of metal protruding underneath the broken and shattered uh, plastic pieces from the taillight? I, I believe it was a plastic chrome piece. And when you were doing the, the testing as far as uh, shooting the glass, the drinking glass at the taillight assembly, that taillight assembly was sort of held there by, by vice grips or something like that. Is that correct? It wasn't actually physically attached to a vehicle the that's, one that you were shooting at? That's correct. <clears throat> now, as far as that... Uh, you're familiar with there was a piece of a, a broken drinking glass that was uh, recovered from uh, the same area of where Mr. O'Keefe uh, was found. Is that correct? It, amongst the, the fragments of the taillight, yes. And are you familiar with uh, Mr. O'Keefe's DNA uh, being present on uh, those pieces of uh, 
the exterior of a broken drinking glass located near his body? I don't believe so. <clears throat> now, as far as Mr. O'Keefe's uh, clothing, uh, his fingernails, are you aware that there was DNA of Mr. O'Keefe and no one else recovered from uh, both his fingernails and from a variety of areas of his clothing? Objection. Sustained. <clears throat> Now, from the crime scene reports uh, that you uh, reviewed, are you aware that there was human hair uh, that was located on the right rear quarter panel near the dent that you were talking about? Objection. I'll allow that. Yes. Are you familiar uh, or are you aware that subsequent mitochondrial DNA testing uh, found that the mitochondrial DNA profile for that hair was consistent to a probability of 99.895% with the mitochondrial DNA profile of Mr. O'Keefe? I'm not aware of that. Now, were you also aware that the broken drinking glass with Mr. O'Keefe's DNA on it uh, was uh, found to be consistent uh, with broken drinking glass pieces uh, that were found in the street? Objection. I'll allow that. Can you repeat the question? Sure. Were you aware that the pieces uh, from the exterior of the broken drinking glass found near Mr. O'Keefe's body with his DNA on it were then uh, found to be consistent with pieces of broken drinking glass that were located in the street of 34 Fairview Road? Yes. <clears throat> were you also aware that pieces of glass that you were talking about from the defendant's bumper uh, were found to be consistent with pieces of glass recovered from the street in front of 34 Fairview Road? Yes. Were you aware that there were microscopic pieces of red and clear plastic, uh, about a sixteenth of an inch by a sixteenth of an inch, that were recovered from Mr. O'Keefe's clothing uh, that were then found to be consistent with the tail? No, I don't believe so. Now, as far as, again, you weren't provided with any sort of uh, reconstruction report from a trooper call from the state police? No, I was not. So you're not aware that he took measurements from the ground to Objection. where certain items were on the vehicle? Objection. The objection sustained. He didn't see the report. Sure. My apologies, Just Just uh, a moment. Yes. Now, Doctor, in the course of your analysis or review of materials here, were you ever provided with a, a video of the defendant backing out of a garage and making contacts uh, with Mr. O'Keefe's vehicle in his driveway at about 5.07 in the morning on January 29th? No. Now, as far as from your review and your testing and everything that you did in this case, if a collision occurred at a lower speed, say one, two, anywhere from zero to five miles an hour, would that uh, create the damage to the taillight uh, that you observed in this particular case? At that speed, no. There were about 10 items that you were provided that you reviewed, is that correct? Correct. And a number of different items that I just asked you about that you weren't provided with or you weren't aware of, correct? Correct. And again, in your report, in the very first paragraph, um, you indicate, however, ARCA reserves the right to supplement or revise this report if additional information becomes available, correct? Correct. I have nothing further on. All right, Mr. Jackson. Thank you, Your Honor. Very briefly, Dr. Wolf, uh, you were asked on cross-examination a couple of questions about a hair. 
um, DNA on the outside of the taillight uh, lens, I'm sorry, the taillight housing, and glass material. Do you recall that? Yes. Does any of that change your opinion about your, uh, your opinions and conclusions in this case? Objection. I'll allow that. Absolutely not. Um, what is your conclusion as to whether or not the damage to the vehicle and the injuries to the human being are consistent or inconsistent with the vehicle interaction? Objection. Sustained. All right, Dr. Wolf, you are all set, sir. Thank you. <coughs> I'm going to allow it.